Hey everybody and welcome to my video. There's only going to be one of these because it's a TLR on the Yashica 44LM. This is a small format TLR. Uh, real quickly, I define small format as anything that produces an image which can fit into a standard old-timey slide projector, which the 4x4 negatives can. So there are people who will say this is a medium format TLR because it uses roll film. They're wrong. It's a small format TLR, and that's okay. Uh, it does take 127 film and creates 4x4 images, so it is the biggest of the small format cameras, and it takes really nice images. This camera has an exposure value light meter up here. I'm going to tell you how to read this so that you know how to take properly exposed images with a 44LM. The shutter speeds on this are from one second up to one five hundredth and bulb. It has 1x viewfinder magnification or close enough to it, meaning that what's in the viewfinder is about one time, it's about life size. And I don't know why I can't get an actual light to shine. There we go. Okay. And the magnification on it is about 100%. So or it's near as makes no difference. So like most TLRs, it has a very, very nice viewfinder. The central focusing screen is a, that works, clear matte. There's a circle in the middle and then those red crosshairs. The red crosshairs on mine are super thick, so I don't know if somebody went in and redrew them. The, the other pictures I've, sh I've seen show like, like hair thin um, red crosshairs. The, um, it has a, the flash sync on this, bizarrely, and I'm not, not sure why it is, does, even though this has a leaf shutter, the flash does not sync at every speed. The flash only syncs at, I think, 1 30th of a second and slower. I don't know why, there it is. 1 50th of a second and slower. So I, I don't understand why it's a leaf shutter. The, the flash should sync at any speed. At any rate, it doesn't, it's, it's weird. Um, the target market for these cameras were advanced users. We know that one because it's a TLR, but it was in a, a budget camera for entry level users because it was designed to take pictures that could be used in a standard 35 millimeter projector uh, using bright, they called them bright slides. And that um, would allow people to take something like this on their trips and then have very high quality slides to share with their friends when they got back. It has really great build quality. It, this is a solid, solid camera. And uh, just everything, with the possible exception of a few pieces of the leather on this, really feel very nicely made. Uh, what I mean by that is that sometimes the leather, the Made in Japan sticker and some of the other pieces of trim fall off with time. But the camera itself is very well made. In fact, as you can see, this camera's been dropped at some point and it still works just fine. Nothing on it was affected by that. That happened before I got it, by the way, just for the record. Uh, this camera also has more refined inputs, such as these dials right here, which control the shutter and aperture, than many of the uh, entry-level cameras of its day. So it was, it was definitely a camera that had a lot of thought and refinement to it, and also it had the, the bay mounts here for, for attachments, just things that would have been found more in higher end TLRs in the 6x6 format. These were made by the Yashica Camera Company from 1959 until 1965 in Japan. It was preceded by the Yashica 44 and it was concurrent also with the 44 and the 44A. This came out a year after the 44. I think the 44A came out slightly after this. And uh, it was also concurrent with multiple 35 millimeter rangefinder cameras from Yashica. It was followed by nothing directly, as in 1965, the Yashica 4x4 TLRs ended, and there was nothing there to follow them. So let's go over this camera as we do, and we'll actually start on the top for a change. I know this is very strange. But here on the top, we have the strap lugs. It has these very curious strap lugs that are different from anything else in the Yashica lineup, at least that I'm aware of. So this is where you would attach a strap to it. I really don't know 
how something attaches to those. So um, don't leave that question, please. I don't know how to answer it. Here we have the, oh, this is the light meter dial. This is an exposure value light meter. It reads much differently than anything else you'll, you've used if you're new to this type of dial. Serial number, Yashica logo. This one has the old style Yashica logo on it. And then the viewfinder hood here. We have the pop-up magnifying glass and the sport finder. There we go, which will not supposed to do that, but sport finder here. If you were to flip that down, you could then look through. Oops, come on. You could then look through that square in the back and roughly line up what you're going to take a picture of. Then we have the sport finder release button right here, which you need to do if before you collapse the viewfinder hood. With the viewfinder, by the way, many cameras, I'm used to just pushing the back of it. With this camera, you close it by pushing the front of it down. If you try pushing the back, you're just going to, to screw up your viewfinder. On the camera's front, here right on top of the camera's front, we have the shutter speed and aperture display. The shutter speeds are in red in front, and then the aperture is in black in back. So the shutter speeds dial is this one here with your right thumb, and then the aperture dial is this one here with your left thumb. So shutter speed and aperture dial. This is the arming lever for the shutter. You have to arm the shutter before you take each photo. Shutter release button. Flash PC socket right here. This is the self timer lever. Uh, I'm not going to use it on this camera because it likes to jam. This is your flash mode selector. I honestly don't know which way is M and which way is X. I think that down like this is for M bulbs and up like this is for X flashes, but my sticker that would tell me has been lost. This is the taking lens where the light for the image passes. This is the viewing lens, which connects to your viewfinder. And then you can see they have bay one mounts around them. On the right side of the camera, here we have the film advance knob. This is the film exposure calculator. We'll see how to do this later in the video. Frame count window. This is the exposure counter reset button right here. And this is the Film Advance release button right here. This is, unlocks the Film Advance after you take a photo to then actually advance the film. You, you can't just advance it willy-nilly after you take a photo until you push that. We'll see how to use this later in the video as well. Over here on the camera's left side, we have the accessory shoe. This would be where you would mount a flash and then run a cable down to the PC port, for instance. This is your focusing knob. So as you adjust it, the, this whole mechanism moves in and out. And the further out it moves, the closer the focus point is. This absolutely useless gizmo right here is a film speed memo. I, I'm honestly, I, I have no idea why this is here. Since on this side, you would set your film speed in the calculator. And this is the side you look at when you're de determining exposure. So no idea what this is for. Then a, this silver inset right here is your depth of field calculator. And again, we'll see how to use this later in the video as well. You can use this for hyperfocal distance and zone shooting as well. It's, uh, this is an incredibly usable thing once you figure out how to use it. On the camera's back, we have the film set window. This serves exactly one purpose when you load the film. We'll see how to do that in a moment. On the camera's bottom, we have the four pegs that it rests on when it's upright, the oh, fifth peg. This is the lock and unlock or open and close dial. You would use to turn that to open it or turn it that way to close it. So if we open it, now we can see what's inside of the camera. So inside of the camera, this is where you would put your new roll of film when you load film. These are film rollers right here that help the film move smoothly through the camera. These are film guide rails. The four dots on the outside prevent the film from moving left and right. And these long silver ones are what the film pressure plate here 
smacks up against to keep it flat on plane. These two triangles here are your start indicators. If your triangles are red, you will probably not have this window here. And so um, these are more important for you to use when you load the film. I have a window, so I'm gonna show you how to load it using the window. Since I don't have one of these that doesn't have a window, I honestly am not 100% sure how to line up the film correctly using these triangles to start your film. I think you just bring the arrows up here and then go, but don't quote me on that. Here's where you would put the film spool that you're going to use to take the film up on as you advance it once you put a new roll of film into the camera. Then we've got a reminder to use 127 film. We saw the film pressure plate. In addition, if you look inside the camera obscura, which is the box here, let me see if I can show you better. There. Right there and right there are a couple of light baffles. Those are not present on the other models of the 44 and uh, they help improve image quality in this camera compared to the other 44s because they improve contrast by cutting out stray light. So the, the, the 44 LM, in theory, would take the best pictures because of that if you didn't have a light meter. If you know how to use the light meter, it will almost certainly take very well exposed photos for you. There, some notes on this camera. There are a lot of people who will swear up and down that this camera has a four element tesser lens in it. And that's not true. The, the lenses are three elements, they're triplets, not sure whether they're cook designs or exactly how they are laid out. There are two elements in front of the shutter and then one element behind it. And you can tell that by looking at the reflections. You can see there, there's two dots reflecting the light up above. That tells you that there are two elements inside of that area between here and the shutter. If we open this up, let's see if we can do the same thing. There we go. Only one dot reflecting off of the light from, that's on top of the camera, which means there's only one element behind the leaf shutter, which means that's a triplet. So don't, don't believe the internet mythology. These do not have tesser type lenses. If, uh, so we talked a little bit about the, the, the lack of the red window on some of these. If your 44LM lacks this red window, and lacks this reset button on the side because the ones without the red window do not have this reset button. What that means is that your camera was probably a Japanese market release because there were a limited number of these that were made lacking those two features and they were only sold in so far as I could find information on in the Japanese market. And because it lacked those two things, the internal mechanisms of those 44 LMs had uh, they, they functioned more like the 6x6 TLRs that Yashica made. These, like I said, have amazing compactness with great quality. They take very, very nice photos. However, the minimum focusing distance on them is far from great. If you want to get a good minimum focusing distance, you will have to buy Bay 1 accessory filters, two of them, one for the taking lens and one for the viewing lens, so you know where you're focused. The minimum focusing distance is 0.9 meters, which is 3 feet. Uh, it's not great. Uh, it's fine if you're taking portraits or something like that, but if you want to take a picture of something smaller than a person, that's not a great minimum focusing distance. There's also no parallax correction on these cameras, which means if you focus with, to a distance of less than 8 feet, which is not marked on this wheel, but if you, so if you assume that you're focusing nearer than 10 feet, then what the, the taking lens sees will be different than what the viewing lens sees. So let's say for instance, I have the camera over here and I wanted to take a picture of this roll of film that we're about to put into it, okay? The viewing lens would see the top half, the taking lens would see the bottom half. That's what parallax correction is. And the, the closer you get to the lens, the worse it is. It starts to be noticeable about eight feet out. If you're closer than eight feet, you'll have to raise the camera slightly. If you, assuming you can't lower the subject, you'll have to raise the camera slightly 
in order to have the taking lens see what the viewing lens saw and do that before you take your photo. So just something to bear in mind with these cameras if you're doing close focus with them. If you're doing macros with filters on the here and here, um, you will really, really need to be very well aware of how your camera is vertically lay lined up with your subject once you get closer than three feet. So these cameras had many, many, many manufacturing variances over the production run, over the six years. Uh, YashikaTLR.com, there's a link of it in the, in the description below, goes into great detail about it on their 44 models page. There are actually two links to that website below. Look for the one that's got the 44 models website. And that can help shine a lot of light on the production variances throughout the life, lifetime. That link also has some input into a theory about how serial numbers were developed. And um, it's a theory, it's not proven. But if that theory is correct, then what we know about this camera is that it was, uh, it's from a batch that entered production in August of 62, which would align with some of the other elements of this camera that uh, some of the design elements of this camera and the way that it was put together. August 62 is, is very possibly exactly when this went into production. So at any rate, that's a really interesting read if you want to learn more about figuring out how old your Yashica 44 LM potentially is. So now that we've gone over the whole thing, let's talk about how to use it. Normally in these videos we talk about mounting and unmounting the lens. There is none of that with this. Okay. The lenses are fixed. So let's jump into changing the film. First thing we have to do is open the bottom. There we go. Down here is where the, the, new, the empty spool is placed. I had it set up correctly. Uh, who'd have thunk it? Okay, so, and you know, you have it working when you turn the dial and this spins. So what happens is there's a, a bit in here that the spool clips into on this side and that's what causes it to spin. Okay, so we're gonna pull that out like this. Now we're gonna take this nice roll of, of uh, film that expired just a month more than 35 years ago. I would be hard pressed to believe that this is still viable. And we're going to load it into the camera. Just like that. Gonna Spin it around this way. Now, real quickly, before I get too far, see this in here, that little gizmo? When this spins, that, this is what advances the frame counter. So if your film, if you don't have film in there, your frame counter isn't going to work, and that's completely normal. So we put it in. Going to get the leader out like this. Going to actually remove the whole band because it says to. And instructions are meant to be followed. There we go. Now, we're going to bring it down here to the, the bottom. And we're going to feed this into that little slot in the take-up spool. And let it catch. Next, we're going to advance until we see Remember these little triangles right here? They're going to be important here in just a sec. You can see this arrow coming in. So we're going to stop right here now that that arrow is lined up with those triangles. We're going to close the camera. We're going to advance this to frame one. So you're going to watch through the red window and look for it to say one. Let's see if we can make that a little bit more visible. Ectochrome one. There we go. Okay, close that. We're not done yet. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to pull that up and then push that in. We've now reset that counter window to one. And I just advanced it a little bit past one accidentally. Didn't mean to do that. You want to uh, not do that. So, when we take our first picture, then you push that button in and advance. 
and I'll show you what happens if you don't push that button in, nothing. You can't advance. So in order to advance the film, you have to push that button in before you wind next. The shutter mechanism and the film advance are not linked in this camera, so you don't, you don't have to advance every time you take a picture, which makes double exposures very easy. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So once the film is loaded in here, it pulls off of here and then just pulls all the way through here until you've shot all 12 frames. And that's just how it, roll, how it works. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through all, I'm just gonna advance this here really quickly and then I'll show you how to unload your film. If you're in the process of taking pictures and you accidentally hit this and reset it to frame one, it's not the end of the world. You lose your count, your spacing on your frames gets a little bit wonky, but um, you can just keep going. You don't lose the entire roll or anything like that. It's 10, 11, and 12. And now, once you finish 12, you just keep advancing. You might have heard that. That was the sound of the paper coming off the, the spool. And that sounds like that's pretty, probably done all the way. Or close enough. In real life, you would not want to take that off. Next thing you're going to do is, there we go, push that little lever forward and back, and now you can take it out. And I'm going to finish advancing this. And I, you didn't, I, if this was real film, you wouldn't want to take that little paper bit that I tore off of it off because that's how you're going to seal the film. Once you have it done, you just push it in like that and wiggle it loose. There we go. You'd fold this side over there. Then you would lick and seal your film shut and send it off to be developed. Then having taken this out from up above, you simply put it into the bottom and get it lined up. There we go, and everything's working. You're good to now either put your next roll of film in or uh, close up shop for the day if you are done taking photos. There we go. And if you look in the little window now, there's a little red symbol. That red symbol means you're, you do not have film in there. So when you're done, don't now reset your frame counter right away. Leave that red symbol there as an indicator that you don't have film. There's another really good way to check and see if you have film or not. That's to switch your shutter to bulb. There we go. Arm your shutter, hold it open, and look through the back. And if you can see light coming through the lens, then you know that there is no film in your camera. That's another way to tell. That one's really pretty foolproof. Next thing we would normally do is talk about how to change the battery, but there's no battery on this camera. It has a light meter, but the light meter is powered by a chemical reaction, so there's no battery to change, which is really nice. And the chemical reaction weakens over time. So if you have a leather case, it's a good idea to store this inside of that to protect that chemical reaction that's going on in here. Uh, if you have one of these where the light meter's dead, it's just dead. There's no making the light meter work again. So let's talk about the light meter because this has an EV system, which is a little strange. Okay, so here we are on the top of the camera. This is the light meter assembly right here. And as you'll see, if you've never seen an exposure value meter before, this is what one looks like. It's a zebra stripe pattern. And there's a little needle there. Let's see if I can get it in view, that little red needle. There we go. That crack is inconveniently placed. Now, if you look on the side of your camera, you'll notice there are numbers one to 10. And I know I'm spoiling the surprise for you, but this is not an accident. And they correspond with the numbers here in your EV meter. So the way that the EV meter works is that light goes into 
we can see the needle hop up right there. Light goes into the cell right here, and that needle then goes to a number. So let's see, if we do this, that needle is sitting at, we'll call it eight, okay, because that's what I could see. So you hold this up to your scene, your needle goes to eight. Now, what you need to do is make sure that your ASA, it's the same thing as ISO, is set properly. So let's say that we're using uh, 100 ISO film. We're gonna now set, oops, wrong button, wrong one. We're now gonna adjust this outer wheel so that the eight lines up with that little white notch in the middle of the, the ASA window, okay? So that eight and that 100, which is your film speed for the, for the sake of this demonstration, are lined up evenly. Up here we see an, this disc with, that's black with white numbers and then here, well black with silver numbers, and then over here it's silver with black numbers. These are your shutter speeds, these are your apertures. So with an EV of, oh that's five, oops, with an EV of eight, at f16 you could shoot at 1 60th of a second with 100 ISO film. At at uh, 1 500th of a second, you could use f5.6. Anything beyond what, 1 500th and f5.6, you can't use that with this camera. Your, your shutter is not fast enough and you're going to overexpose if you set to 1 500th and f4 or f3.5. If you set it to f22, you can shoot at 1 30th of a second. Anything faster than that and you're going to overexpose as well because you'll have too much light for the, the, the aperture. 1 500th at f5.6 is the same amount of light as, as 1 30th at f22, is the same as 1 1 25th at f11. So your exposure value of eight means that you can have any of these that line up, shutter speed to aperture, available to use because they're all the same amount of light. Stick with 100 ISO film. What happens if you had an exposure value of four? then all of this shifts. At f3.5, you could use 1 1 25th. At f22, you could use a half second. Again, all of these are the same amount of light, and these are the available combinations that you can use for shutter speed and aperture. So that's how you read the EV light meter and calculate the shutter speed using the built-in exposure calculator. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is how to use the exposure scales here, or the, the depth of field scales, rather, on the focusing dial. We know they're depth of field scales because they're right next to the focusing dial. So let me get this tilted so it's a little bit easier to see. So here we have the infinity focus, and there's a little tiny dot above it. Those dots go away after that, but if you center your, your focus distance, uh, in the center of that 3.5, then we know that at, at f3.5, at, if you focus at 10 feet, everything within that black area there will be in focus. That's nift, a nifty little factoid, right? Well, if we line up the infinity focus with that red line there, that's, that corresponds with f8 and that red line. So we know that using this setting, everything from infinity back to, that's probably about, um, it's probably about seven meters, eight meters, something like that, so let's call it 25 feet, will be in focus, which is nifty. If we set infinity focus to the outside of this uh, plate, that corresponds with F16. So then, Every, at, at this, with F, at F16, with infinity focus set there, everything down to 10 feet or three meters would be in focus. That's the hyperfocal distance. You could use, you could go out to F22, but um, it's not marked on here. So I, any, anything for F22 would just be hazarding a guess. But let's say you're, you're not using infinity. Let's say you're closer. Well, here we are at three meters. If we have f16, everything as close as 1.5 meters would be in focus. So that's what, we, that's what that's telling us. Basically, if you use f16, 11, 8, 5, 6, or 3, 5, what this scale tells you 
is that from one edge of the, sh the, the shape or one end of the line to the other, that's what's in focus using the numbers on the, the focusing knob there. That's how you read this scale and what it's trying to tell you. So let's take a look at the viewfinder here. And here we go, there's the viewfinder. So when you look through here, what you see is a plain matte screen with a central cir circle. The circle's just a, a focusing aid. The crosshairs are also focusing aids. What you're gonna use is the screen itself to bring your subject into focus by adjusting this knob here, moving the lenses in and out. And once you get focus, then uh, you can take your picture. We'll do, see how to do that in a second. The vertical crosshair lines are for if you're taking a picture of a building, you just line up a vertical line there and that helps you make sure that your verticals are straight. Your horizontal crosshair lines are for if you're taking a picture, let's say of the sunset over the ocean and you wanna get your horizon level straight, that's what you would use. You'd put your horizon somewhere around in there or be able to use those to, to level it up. And that, that's, those are framing aids to help you get better photos when you take pictures with this camera. If you wanna find focus and have good detail, you just push the, this part of it forward or backward into the camera. And then the magnifying glass pops up here. And the magnifying glass will allow you to look through that and get fine focus on the focusing screen so that you can get the details you want to be in, in proper focus, actually in proper focus. And then when you're done, you just close that and you're ready to go. So let's take everything that we've learned and let's put it together and take a photo with the Yashica 44LM. So the first thing that you wanna do is read your light meter. Okay, so you're gonna find the EV value, which right now is three, four, it's four. We're gonna go over to the calculator. We have our correct ISO set in. So we're gonna dial this over to four. Okay, so now we know we have that correct. And at 1 60th of a second, we can use F4. So we're gonna come over here, you're gonna use your right thumb, look at the window here on top of the lenses to select 1 60th of a second. These dials are a little bit challenging to move sometimes, especially backwards and upside down. And then we're gonna use the aperture dial to select F4, there we go. So now we have our shutter speed and aperture set correctly. Next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna arm the shutter. We're gonna do this now so that we can take the picture as soon as we're ready to. We're gonna open up the viewfinder hood and the magnifying glass and then focus until, oh, there we go. Now that's in focus, take the picture. I'll show you how to take the picture again after you arm the shutter and you have it in focus, you just take the picture. Then once you've taken the picture, you push that button in advance until you get to the next frame and this thing stops advancing. Now you're ready to go to take your next picture. Okay, so that's really easy. What about a double exposure? Well, double exposures with the Yashica 44LM are super easy. It's really good for that. And that's because the shutter mechanism is not connected to the film advance. So the, the, the science of, of double exposures is that if you take two frames worth of light and put them on the same frame, you're gonna have a very overexposed frame. You don't wanna do that. So you need to have less light coming in for each of the two double exposures. In fact, you need half as much light. The EV calculator can really, really help you with that. So we know right now that 1 60th at F4 is our proper exposure. Well, if we want half as much light, let's take F4 and let's follow it one stop. That's 1 1 25th. So 1 1 25th is a higher number, but this is a fraction. It's twice as fast, it's half as much light. So we know now that our double exposure shutter speed needs to be 1 1 25th at F4. There we go, okay. So the rest of the process is gonna be exactly like taking a, a regular picture. You're gonna arm the shutter, you're gonna find your proper focus, and you're gonna take a picture. You're not going to advance the film. The next thing you're gonna do is rearm the shutter, 
and you're going to recompose and take your second picture. Now you're going to advance the film and stop when it stops. That's how you take a double exposure. All you have to do is not advance the film between shots. You can take as many, if you want to take a, a thousand frames, it'll look terrible, it's useless, don't do that please. But if you wanted to take a thousand frames, a thousand pictures on the same frame, you could do that by just figuring out what your actual shutter speed should be and going over and over and over again on the same frame. Very, very simple process, just like that. If you wanted to do a triple exposure, you could do that. You just have to do some, you just have to not go two stops, but you would go one stop and maybe half a stop on your aperture. One of the nice things about this camera is that the aperture settings, they're marked, but there's nothing to stop you from going halfway in between. You could do, well, that's probably about an f6.3 right there, for instance, even though it's not marked in the aperture window. And that's, that's how you do double exposures. They are, this is a double exposure machine, I'm not gonna lie, it's really good for that. So some things not to do with your camera. Uh, don't touch the shutter. I mean, if you do, that means that you've taken the lens apart, and if you don't know what you're doing, please don't take the lens apart either. Don't touch the mirror. Again, if you're doing that, then it means you've taken the viewfinder apart, and if you don't know what you're doing, please don't do that either. If you're going to store your camera for any amount of time, make sure to trigger the shutter before you do that. If you arm the shutter and then you just leave it, there's a bunch of springs in here that are gonna be under tension all the time until this shutter is triggered. So if you just leave it, they're gonna develop a memory of being under tension and then they're not gonna work properly when you need them to and it will screw up the shutter timing in these cameras. So, and what I mean by that is trigger your shutter if you're gonna, if you don't wanna take a picture and you realize you don't wanna take it and you're gonna go walking for 20 more minutes, trigger your shutter. Uh, you can put a lens cap on it if you wanted to, uh, if you, to preserve that. There's no reason to advance the film after you take a picture, you don't have to. So if you trigger your shutter, uh, when you realize that you're not about to take a photo and it's gonna be a while, there you go, you can just go about your business and then when you do take a picture, just rearm it and take the photo that, then, and then advance the film. Don't leave your camera in your car because there are lubricating oils in the shutter and also in the aperture. The aperture is not such a big deal because as soon as you adjust the aperture setting here, it's adjusted in the camera. Let's see if I can show you what that looks like. There we go. So as I adjust the aperture dial, the aperture stops down instantly. There's, it's not like an SLR where the aperture stops down as part of the shutter sequence. If I set this at f22 and leave it there, it will be at f22 forever and it doesn't affect the shutter one way or the, or the aperture rather, one way or the other. So you don't have to store the aperture a certain way. So if oil gets on the aperture in this camera, it's not a huge deal, but if it gets into the shutter, it will screw up your shutter timing. Ow, 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 ow. And you definitely don't want that to happen. In addition, don't keep your camera in your car because the oils in here, if it gets cold in your car, can get gummy and then they break down and they stay gummy and they don't lubricate properly. And the other thing is if you leave your camera in your car, it's a really good way to come back to your car with a broken window and no camera. So I, even if you're just walking in for, you know, to the retirement home for 10 minutes to say hello to your grandma and tell her about all the great photos you took today, don't leave your camera in your car. Don't keep it in the plastic bags or boxes. I keep mine in Pelican cases, most of them, because I can put a rechargeable desiccant pack in with them, which pulls the moisture out of the air and really helps these uh, last a long time. You don't want to have moisture, that's the enemy. But if you put it in a bag or a box without that, moisture will infiltrate and, and permeate through the plastic, and it will cause fungus to grow on the lens elements, in the leather, things like that. And that's a good way to really degrade the performance of your camera and make it smell pretty funky when you put your nose right next to it to take a picture. And don't let this camera get wet. It's not weather sealed and water can definitely rust the components in the shutter together, which would cause the shutter to stop working. And just remember your, your Yashica 44LM is a precision tool. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. So that's it for my Yashica 44LM video. 
If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Pretty good about answering fairly quickly. If this video was helpful, please leave me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm making content which is helpful and useful to you and lets me know I'm on the right track. If you have suggestions for future videos, please leave those below. Those are always appreciated. If you'd like to subscribe, you can do that and turn on the notifications button uh, bell to find out when I have more film and camera videos coming out. And one last thing, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.